This is the North Sea, sometimes calm and smooth, sometimes stormy and treacherous, across which there has been an ebb and flow of peoples to Britain over many centuries. Our period begins when the Roman troops were being withdrawn and the Romano-British population were left to fend for themselves. Saxons and Franks were raiding the shores. Dover was the port nearest to the continent of Europe and a lighthouse guided the merchant shipping safely across the waters from Gaul. During the 400 years of Roman occupation, the face of the country had changed completely. Trade and prosperity had greatly increased. Towns had developed, and there was an extensive network of good roads. By 400 AD, the Roman army had many serving Anglo-Saxons, and their families had been allowed to join them in an attempt to minimize the danger caused by the withdrawal of Roman troops and the now frequent raids on the east coast. Long before this, a chain of forts had been built to combat this danger, the so-called Saxon Shore Forts. The northeast coast was also protected by a series of signal stations. These shore forts had served their purpose, and for a few generations, Roman Britain survived. But eventually, the raids became major migrations of peoples from the Anglo-Saxon homeland. In boats similar to this, they came to settle on the fertile, cultivated lands of eastern Britain, alongside the settlements already established under Roman rule. By 500 AD, the East and the Thames Valley were heavily populated, but opposition was encountered to the West, and following the Battle of Mount Baden, the legendary King Arthur became the symbol of Celtic resistance. Cadbury Castle in Somerset is an important hill fort. It has been systematically excavated over several years to determine the sequence of settlement, as the site has long been associated with the legends of King Arthur's palace at Camelot. Examination of the defences showed a definite rebuilding of the complete circle of walls during the 5th and 6th centuries AD, the time of King Arthur. From the evidence, it has been possible to reconstruct the elaborate timber work which, supporting a wooden parapet, withheld the onslaught of the Saxons. Throughout the southeast, Saxon kingdoms came into being by 600 AD and their boundaries may still be seen, like the great Offa's Dyke in the west, 90 miles long, the Wands Dyke in the south, and possibly the Devil's Ditch in Cambridgeshire. There is very little to be seen above ground of the Anglo-Saxon period, but air photographs of crop marks has led to the discovery of many sites. The gravel terraces along the River Thames at Mucking show evidence of occupation, circular Iron Age settlements, rectangular Roman defence works, and the many large black dots which represent Saxon huts. Gravel working was rapidly destroying this area, and in advance of the machines, a rescue operation was carried out to reveal the pattern of the settlements. The Saxon settlement was spread along half a mile of the seaward slope. On this levelled gravel surface, the outline of one of the huts can be made out and is being dampened to make it more visible. After careful excavation, the dugout floor shows the extent of the hut. Clay weights from a loom were found in the centre of the floor and two post holes for the roof supports. In contrast to this scattered community, a complete Saxon village has come to light at West Stowe in East Anglia, where meticulous excavation has revealed a complex plan. The site dates from about 400 AD and was occupied for about 250 years. There were many huts, but for the first time the discovery of four larger halls. 
The area was mechanically cleared, and in the top of the natural gravel, details of the extent of the huts could be followed. Over 60 huts were excavated, two burnt ones showing that they were well built, with wooden floors over a pit or cellar, with plank walls and a thatched roof. The small huts cluster round the four larger halls, suggesting family groups. Two looms were discovered with loom weights lying where they had fallen after the hut had been burnt to the ground. The economy of the village is shown by the thousands of food bones, including a high proportion of adult sheep. Wool was obviously important. There were over a hundred fine combs in a very good state of preservation. Let us look at some of the everyday things of early Anglo-Saxon times. From cemeteries in East Anglia have come beads, buckles and many ornaments. A well-made pair of tweezers. Large bronze brooches were in use in the 6th century. A stylized face forms the terminal of this one. The iron pin, used to hold the brooch in position, has long since decayed. Weapons were buried with the warriors, swords, shields and spears, as at mucking. Anglo-Saxon pottery is handmade, not thrown on a wheel and is usually in plain baggy shapes. Some is decorated with fingernail impressions or with stamped ornament of various designs. Some pots were very large and were probably used for storage. In southeastern Britain, traditionally the area of Jutish settlement, many rich cemeteries have been excavated. Finds include these brooches, gilt bronze inlaid with garnet, crystal balls as pendants, and glass claw beakers of fine workmanship imported from the Rhineland. A photograph of many years ago, taken at Taplow on the Thames, shows the excavation of a burial of pagan splendour, of a king whose belongings included this drinking horn. The rim has settings for jewels and is decorated with human faces. Gold buckles are set with garnets and lapis lazuli. Hanging bowls with decorative plates are unexplained features of the Saxon household. One was found in the remarkable Sutton Hoo ship burial. This photograph shows the imprint in the sand. This burial site of kings of East Anglia lies at the head of an estuary ten miles from the sea. A great open rowing boat was uncovered, some 80 feet long and 14 feet wide. Dated about 625, there are close connections with the Swedish royal house. Amidships was the burial chamber, and from this came the most remarkable collection of Saxon articles on an unprecedented scale. The great belt buckle with animal interlaced design. The purse lid with mythical birds and beasts in inlaid garnet. 
and two shoulder clasps, wonderfully designed and executed, craftsmanship of the very highest order. In the north of Britain, at Bambra in Northumberland, a capital of the English kings was founded in 547, on a site now occupied by the great 12th century castle. Barely five miles away is Lindisfarne, Holy Island. About 635, St. Aidan came here from the sacred isle of Iona to establish a Christian monastery within sight of the royal palace. A causeway was the only connection with the mainland. An illustrated manuscript from the monastery still survives. It was later to be attributed to the angels, so intricate is the work. These are the Lindisfarne Gospels, written and illustrated towards the end of the 7th century. Celtic, Germanic and Mediterranean art styles intermingled. Christianity and pagan mythology coexist on this whalebone casket, which shows on the left the pagan legend of Wayland the Smith and on the right the adoration of the Magi. The religious houses were the centres of learning and scholarship. Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English nation collected together details of past events. And the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is the earliest known history written in English. Later, the heroic poem of Beowulf and the great beast Grendel was recorded to tell us something of the ideals prevailing in Anglo-Saxon society, with many details of everyday life. Christianity rapidly became established, and crosses were set up where the gospel was preached. The Bewcastle Cross in northern Britain shows carving inspired by the art of the Eastern Mediterranean, with vine scrolls and classical figures mixed with the love of interlace of northern Europe. On the misty banks of the River Tyne at Jarrow, one of the earliest churches was built, beside the remains of the monastic settlement, the home of the first English historian, Bede. Monkwearmouth Church dates from 674 and has a fine Saxon tower. At Eskham in Durham, a similar church survives, with characteristic high, narrow nave. And at Bradwell in Essex, this chapel was built on the wall of a Roman fort. Bradford-on-Avon is well preserved with fine masonry. And the tower at Earls Barton in Northamptonshire belongs to the last phase of Anglo-Saxon architecture and dates from the late 10th century. The decoration is probably based on timber work. In contrast, a wooden church erected in the Essex forests at Greenstead, about 850, has walls constructed of vertical split logs. By 750 AD, Britain had numerous established kingdoms, and soon it was the turn of the Saxons to defend themselves from raiders and invaders. The longships of the Vikings crossed the northern seas, and all around the coast attacks developed. The marauding Norsemen came from the sheltered waters of the fjords of Norway and the mainland of Denmark. They were ruthless seafaring men who came to destroy and plunder, particularly the rich Christian monasteries. Their ships were propelled by sail and oars. A well-preserved one came to light at Gokstad in Norway. It was under a very large burial mound, and around were oars and cordage, 
three small boats, six beds, a sledge, twelve horses and six dogs. The boat now rests in the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. Made entirely of oak, it was built for 16 pairs of oars and shows a thoroughly practical knowledge of shipbuilding. The Vikings' object was to terrify their foes. Out of a red foreboding sunrise they would strike, attack and kill with fire and sword. From the fury of the Northmen, good Lord deliver us. From 793 onwards, many monasteries were sacked, Lindisfarne and Jarrow. There were numerous raids. To East Anglia in 865 came the great army from Denmark. Its campaigns are recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. A kingdom was founded at York, and eventually the whole of eastern England came under Danish rule, the Danelaw. Fifty years earlier than this, in the south, the Kingdom of Wessex became supreme. Its capital was Winchester. Winchester has been an ecclesiastical centre for centuries and was the capital of King Alfred, a great Saxon leader. Around the present cathedral, a search has been going on to discover the site and extent of the old and new minsters of Saxon times, only known until now from historical records. Beside and partly beneath the present building, the walls of the Saxon minster were found. The Winchester Research Unit has been making a complete historical investigation of the city's development back in time to the medieval Saxon and Roman settlements to piece together the life of the city. It shows that Roman Winchester had a regular pattern of streets within its walls. But after the Romans had left, this street pattern disappeared, and in early Saxon times, houses were built on the hard surface of the main highway. Six hundred years later, the settlement pattern had evolved to this, and the Minster had become the centre of life of the community. Perhaps this is the figure of King Alfred. The Alfred jewel is the work of a skilled craftsman, and around the edge are the words, Alfred ordered me to be made. It is thought to be the handle of a pointer. But Alfred was not secure. And soon the Danes attacked again and again. He was driven to the west, to the Somerset Marshes. But his great achievement, carried on by his son and grandson, was to transform the old kingdom of the West Saxons into England, with English, Danes and Norse among its subjects. There were many towns by the 10th century, and new settlements being made in the forested areas. These settled conditions led to a monastic revival. It was the great age of Anglo-Saxon book production, particularly the Winchester School. The new minster Liber Vitae shows the Danish king, Canute, presenting a golden cross to Winchester. Canute was a formidable warrior, and in Denmark are the remains of well-organized military fortresses of his time. This one at Trelleborg was beside a river, and the wooden houses inside the rampart were built in the shape of boats. The fortress was remarkably well laid out, and one crew of a Viking longship was quartered in each house. One has been reconstructed. From such fortresses, Canute crossed the seas with his highly trained forces. And in 1011, he succeeded to the throne of England. An Anglo-Danish royal house was then established. By these late Saxon times, England was prosperous, having a well-developed trade with the continent, 
particularly through Dorstad at the mouth of the Rhine, where extensive excavations have revealed the remains of a large trading port. The people here had many connections across the sea. In England, the ports of Southampton, London and Ipswich thrived on this trade. At Ipswich, deep below present ground level, pieces of amphora for Rhenish wine were found. Anglo-Saxon England came to a dramatic end with the Norman invasion. Here is William, Duke of Normandy, soon to be king. And so, like the waves upon the shore, the successive migrations over a span of nearly seven centuries had welded together a diversity of peoples during an intensely formative period which was Anglo-Saxon England.